You can be seated. Well, happy Mother's Day. Even if it's not relevant for you, happy Mother's Day anyway. So, those of you who are a mother or who had a mother, you can. Um, I don't know if you know, let me tell you something about marketing because I just get you st- just started. I don't know if you know this. The whole purpose of marketing is to make you discontent. And that's, that's the reason that they have them, okay? The reason they're ads is to make you discontent and to convince you that you can become content by doing or acquiring whatever it is that they are offering you, okay? And to do that, they are very good at finding the niches in your heart, the areas where you have shame, where you have desire. If you'll notice, like a lot of times luxury cars, they're not selling you the car, they're selling you the peace that will come into your life because you now have the car. You ever seen that? This is like, matter of fact, there was a car c- c- uh, ad a few a couple years ago that didn't even show the car. It just showed how you felt while driving the car in traffic, like you were in the middle of a field. And they'll they'll, they'll plug into your fears, your doubts, your. your and w- one of the greatest in that respect, greatest meaning worst, commercials ever. And some of you are old enough to remember it, but it was such a land. What's the word I'm looking for? Lost the word. Anyway, groundbreaking commercial that it still people talk about it. And it was, uh, uh, the lines were, if you remember this, I can bring home the bacon, and it's a woman singing, I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan, and never let you forget you're a man, because I'm a woman. And then it was advertising, I think, a perfume, because obviously perfume's going to fix that. Okay? But it really encapsulated one area are one of the key areas for women in the area of shame. Because, I don't, you may or not, may not know this, you'll know this when I tell you this, women and shame, there's, a, there's this concept that somewhere over here is this box. And some people call this box normal, some call it perfection, some call it the ideal. Some of you don't even have a name for it, you're just aware that it quote-unquote exists. And if you can get your family, your husband, your children, your house, your job, your career, your spiritual life, every area of your life exactly in sync, exactly in tune, then you will be in this box and that's where joy comes from. And if you are away from that box in any way, in any area, what you feel is shame. And women are always, I think, if I'm wrong, at some level, feeling ashamed because some part of their life is not in that perfect sink of bringing home the bacon, frying it up in the pan, doing absolutely everything, keeping the family perfectly in harmony, keeping the marriage exactly right, being exactly perfect and at their jobs. And the farther a woman feels that she is from that box, the more shame that she feels. And marketing, if you look, drives those things. The farther she is from the perfect body, the more shame she should feel. The perfect makeup, the perfect hair. Why do you think, did you guys stop with this? Just think of this just for a second. Is Cosmo, Cosmopolitan, is that a magazine aimed at you or, or your spouse or a, a woman in general? Have you ever, guys, don't, please don't raise your hands. Have you ever bought Cosmo? Please say no. Okay. It's aimed at women. What's on the cover? Have you ever, you ever noticed they hardly ever put dudes on the covers of magazines? Because dudes are attracted to attractive women, and women are shamed by attractive women, and they put that on the cover to make you think you're supposed to be that. Aren't you glad you came today? Now, let me, let me tell you, since I've already brought it up, guys are shamed in a different way. Guys' shame derives from a different source, for the, as far as I can tell from most guys and what I've read. Guys are shamed by weakness. Any form of weakness, any perception of weakness makes a guy feel ashamed. Ladies, you've been talking to a guy in in purpose or accidentally demeaned him, made him weak. And you can see he just, shame just blossoms because guys are never supposed to be weak. That's, That's our thing of shame. Now, do you think that's how God wants us to live? The answer is no. Okay. Do you think, since we're on a, you know, a family series, do you think that's how God wants us to raise our children? 
Do you think God wants us to raise our children in, in an area of shame where they acquire, without you ever saying it, this idea of if they can achieve this perfection, they'll be okay, and if not, they should be, does that think it's what God's wanting? Do you think God wants your sons to think that if they're ever weak, they should be ashamed of that? Think that's what his purpose is? I don't think so. And we're going to be looking at a passage that talks, it talks about living into what God wants us to do our, on our own and also as families. And it's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you're going to turn in your Bible or turn on your Bible to Deuteronomy 6. And we'll be looking at that today and we'll see how God kind of subtly addresses the concept of not being perfect and living just fine without being perfect. It's in Deuteronomy 6, I'm going to start in verse 1. And in Deuteronomy, you've got, what you have is the Israelites nation. They've come out of the slavery in Egypt. They spent 40 years wandering in the desert. And Deuteronomy is the second telling of the law. God gave them an Exodus and Leviticus. He then gives it to them again before they go into the promised land. So he's retelling them stuff he's already told them. And chapter 6, verse 1, these are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you're about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord as long, Lord your God, as long as you live. Now listen to this part. If you obey, he's got a bunch of promises here. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you'll enjoy a long life. Yeah, that's cool. Listen carefully, Israel, and be careful to obey. And this one. Then all will go well with you. Live a long life, all will go well with you if you can follow these commands. And you'll have many children. Some of you consider that a blessing and some not as much. You have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey. And milk and honey, milk is a sign of stability. Because the only way you can have milk is you have to have a cow or a goat or or a goat primarily, that is stable enough for you to be able to feed it regularly so you can milk it. So it's a sign of stability to be able to get milk from your animals. If you're going through the desert and you're moving your animals constantly, you won't be able to get milk from your animals. So that's a sign of stability. Milk and honey. And honey, candy. Really, I mean, honey doesn't have a major purpose in life except to add some enjoyment to it. So he says, if you follow the commands, you'll live a long life, you'll have a good life, and you'll have a stability and candy. Now that's a win, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. In verse 4, he starts talking about how to get to the land of stability and candy, okay? Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. Now he gets into the family. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, live in the middle of the commands. Then move on down to verse 20. Verse 20, in the future your children will ask, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? Or in other words, to put it in kid language, why? Okay, your kid ever asked that question? Why? Now, it's interesting that when, when, when the, he says, when they ask you why, you don't say, although sometimes you, but in this instance, you don't say, because I said so. Okay? They ask why, your comeback is, you must tell them we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give our ancestors. And the Lord our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him, here it is, so he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives as he has done to this day. So, when they ask why, his response, because when you live in line, in sync with God's commandments, he brings blessings into your lives. And when you choose to live outside of God's standards and God's commandments, then you're living in the area of being cursed. I'm not sure your kids are going to like that one, but that's what he says to tell them. Okay? So, we've got the promises, we've got the commands. I want you to start out, though, with something you may not have thought about when I read it. It's just a couple words thrown in a couple times. And it has to do with resumes. Do you, I mean, most of you guys have done a resume before. Do you have things that can potentially show up on your resume that you don't want to be there? I mean, I've got things from like earlier that it's like, I'm really glad that if, I don't do resumes anymore, but if I were to do a resume that it's long enough ago or enough jobs ago that it doesn't have to show up. If you're like me when you're younger, there were like jobs that would, they would cycle off the bottom. 
right? Because you now had enough to, put, to fill up the page, and so you could take that one and just, oh, we're just, we'll just not mention that one anymore. You know, um, for instance, when I was my senior year in college, trying to survive financially my last year of college, I worked as a door-to-door salesman. I went door-to-door, knocked on people's doors who were really, really wanting me to be there, and tried to sell them vacuum cleaners. It's as much fun as it sounds, and the people love you for it. They just love you for it. And yeah, that's the one knocking on the door. And, and the thing is, that w- I, I went lower, because that really didn't, didn't work out for me. And so I moved on to what we would euphemistically refer to as indoor sales. Um, indoor sales can mean a number of things. In my case, it meant we were selling things and they would hand me a, a page out of the phone book and say, start here and call people. You know that person who called you at dinner time interrupts you? I was a telemarketer. I'm sorry. God has forgiven me. I'm hoping you can too. Now, I really don't like to include those. Whenever I'm doing a thing, what have you done with your life? What, you know, I never, ever, ever say door-to-door salesman and telemarketer. I never bring those up. No? Well, if you looked at what Moses told his people, he says, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt, verse 12. And verse 21, it says, you must tell them we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. Now, there is door-to-door sales. There is telemarketing. And there is slavery. Okay, this is not what you want on your resume. This is not the thing you want to go, oh yeah, what were you doing before you came to this? Oh, I was a slave. Yeah, somebody owned me. I I mean, that's not exactly the thing you, you know, why would you, he leads with that because he wants, I think, to teach them a valuable lesson, us a valuable lesson. And that lesson is to face your flaws. See, one of the things we want to do because we want to be in this box or we don't want to show any weakness is we want to deny our flaws. We want to pretend like we're perfect, pretend like the family's perfect, pretend like we're strong and never worry about anything. And he says, no, you were slaves. You you should just go ahead and get over yourself. Paul in Romans puts it slightly differently. He says, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. We're all screwed up, we're all messed up. Now, let, let me break this down into about into two or three pieces for you to help you understand. When I say face your flaws, because that's kind of vague, Let, let's break it down. Um, first thing that is in there is to own your failures, but forsake your sins. Own your failures, but forsake your sins. See, failures are a really good thing. Failures are just ways to learn what doesn't work. When I, when I first um, started going in, into ministry, um, I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know what was going to work out. I tried lots of stuff. I have taught every age group in a church. I have been a nursery supervisor or assistant nursery supervisor. I've taught five-year-olds. I've taught junior high kids. I've taught high school kids. I've taught senior adults. And I've taught wide range. Re- I've found I've got a, a, a sweet spot somewhere around 18 to 80, right in there. Maybe a little over 80, but generally speaking in there. Once they drop, you get below 18, I've got some challenges. I, it's just not my sweet spot. But the only way I found it was by getting on a classroom and trying to teach middle schoolers. And realizing, this is not working at all. And then getting in front of a group of, of adults and going, oh, this is clicking. But without the failure, you don't learn about it. And I'm afraid a lot of times that we want to teach our kids not to fail. And the reality is that's where you learn the best stuff. Matter of fact, as, as, a, as the leader, lead pastor of the church, a lot of times I'll start worrying about the staff if we're not failing, if we're not trying things that don't work. Because you're not trying some stuff that's not work, doesn't work. You're not pushing hard enough. You're not experimenting enough. You're not finding the really cool stuff that will work. The only way to find the really cool stuff that works is to mess up. And with your kids, what do you want to teach them when they fail? Because your kids are going to fail. Now, if they fail a grade or, or a test because they didn't study, that's a different thing. But when they're trying something special and spectacular and it, and it, it wipes out, woohoo! 
Matter of fact, think about it. Some of you, some of you moms are liable to get a really good failure today. Your, your five-year-old, seven-year-old may decide that what you need today is a piece of artwork. And, you're, and your seven-year-old is going to get the crayons out, and they're going to get the paper out, and they're going to do something really special with crayons. And by any artistic standard, humans would actually apply. It's a disaster, right? It's just... But of course, I mean, that's if you turn off your mommy glasses... You know, you got your mommy glasses on and all that comes off the page is love. But if you take off the mommy glasses, what comes off the page, what that five-year-old did for you, is abject artistic failure. And what do you do? I'll give you a secret. You can always say, you tried so hard. I'm so proud of you for trying so hard. You don't actually have to lie to them and say it's good. You don't have to. You can just say... No, but you reward the effort. You say, that was good. When your kid tries to ride a bike for the first time and it doesn't work out, what do you do? Oh, yeah, well, maybe bike riding is just not in your future. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, tricycles are not that demeaning. Uh, and walking is way underrated. So let's just work. No, you always want to say, okay, you failed. What did you learn? Let's go to the next one. Let's try again. The only way you're ever going to do great things and the only way your kid's ever going to do great things is if your kid tries great things. And if you're the one who's constantly saying, don't try that, you're going to fail, what are you teaching them? Nothing real good, are you? Now, however, there's a difference between failing and sinning. Sinning is when you do something that's wrong, you do it on purpose, you intentionally violate God's standards, Okay? Now those, there's a specific response of forsaking in the word for that is repentance. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's a huge lesson for your kid. No, you did something wrong and you need to confess that. You need to acknowledge that before God and ask for God's forgiveness. That's that's really crucial. And that brings us to the next one, which some of you guys are going to love and some of you are going to think your mother was amazing at this one. And that is we are to avoid shame and encourage guilt. What? Well, see, here's the problem. A lot of you have conflated the two terms, shame and guilt. You've come, you, you don't know the difference between the two. There's a huge difference between shame and guilt. A lot of times what people are doing when they're bringing guilt is they're actually bringing shame and calling it guilt. Okay? Um, 2 Corinthians 7.10 sums it up real nicely. It says, for godly grief, and godly grief would be guilt. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Cool. Worldly grief, which is shame, produces death. The difference between guilt is something that I did that I can ask forgiveness for. Shame is who I am. And we've got to remember two truths with you and with your kids. Okay, two, these are the two truths that define you. Okay? If anything defines you, it's these two truths. Number one, you're made in the image of God. At your very fiber, the core of your being, you were made in the image of God. That means that you were made for a relationship with God. You were made with a relationship with other people. You were made to live into some amazing things God wants to do in you and through you. You were created for greatness because you're made in the image of God, and God doesn't do poor. Right? God doesn't make something and say, I don't want that one. Yeah, that was meant to be under the birdcage. That's what we call that one. No, you were created to do Amazing things as the image of God. And that's a very true thing about you. Matter of fact, it's the truest thing about you. But the second thing, which is also true, is that you're fallen. You're a sinner. You rebel against God. You do things that are wrong. You do them on purpose. And you do them again and again and again. And you and your children are fallen images of God. And those two truths are constantly at conflict in your life and the life of your children. Now, what do you want to do? I want to encourage the image of God and discourage the fallenness. I want to live in, them to live into the image of God and move away from fallenness. Does that make sense? And that's what you want to do in your life too, right? You want to move away from your fallenness, move toward the image of God. In other words, with your kids and yourself, you always point up toward the image of God and not down. Let me give you a trick for doing this in your life, in your kids' lives, and anybody else that you deal with. When your kid does something wrong, you need to remember the difference between you are and you did. 
between you are and you did. Let's say you have your kid in front of you and something is broken and you know who did it. Okay, they're, they're, the evidence is overwhelming. If this was a crime show, it would last only 42 seconds because we know who did this. There is no mystery. And you look the child square in the eyes and you say, did you break that? Now, your child has two choices, right? They, well, there's probably the third choice. The third choice is to try to de- deflect. I don't even know what happened. Blame on somebody else. But they can admit it or they can deny it. Now, if they deny it, what do you say? Not you are, but you did. You don't say you are a liar. You say you are lying. See the difference? You did lie to me. Not what you are, it's what you did. However, if they just look you square in the eye and a little tear rolls down the side and they say, I broke it. Then you say, you are honest and you are brave. Now, there may be a penalty to pay for breaking it, but you as a person are a brave, honest individual. And so I always, you always point them toward what they can be in God by saying, you are this positive and you did this negative. That makes sense? Because that always points them in the right direction and it moves them away from shame. Because when you say you are a liar, you're saying that's an impenetrable part of what you are. You can't get over it. You should be ashamed of yourself. And you don't want your child dealing with shame. You don't want them carrying that because it doesn't work. Because what do we say? Worldly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly grief, shame, produces death. That make sense? See, Romans 8, 1 says, There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And condemnation is also another word for shame. Okay? Now, so we've owned our failures, forsaken our sins. We've avoided shame and encouraged guilt. The last, last piece of that puzzle is teach value, not superiority. I got to say, this is a challenge for me and my family. I don't know whether it's, I talked to somebody else and they said their family had a challenge with it too. Because it's awfully easy to make fun of people. To say, look at that one, look at that, look at that. And the message that you're subtly sending, maybe not even meaning to, is that that person is lesser. That family is lesser, that kid is lesser, that driver is lesser. And there's two ways you can build up somebody. One way is by pushing other people down. And the other is by lifting someone up. And what you want to do with your kids is always lift them up. You are the image of God. You are special. God loves you very much. You are somebody that God is crazy about. You know, the whole, the whole how much God loves you thing is building somebody up. This, the, uh, the thing that you are better than somebody else, that's pushing somebody else down. And it doesn't make you feel better. It just makes... You feel less bad about yourself. So you're always looking to to teach value, not superiority. Matter of fact, anybody want to raise a narcissist? Is that one? Anybody have that goal with your kids, your your family members, your friends? You want to be narcissistic? You know how you can raise a narcissist. This will this will work if you've got a baby and you want to raise this child to be a complete narcissist. Don't teach them value. Teach them superiority. Spend all their time telling them how much better they are than everybody else. Give them constant evidence that they are superior, and you will end up with a wonderfully narcissistic, entitled child who everyone will lo- lo- hate. Because you've met this kid, haven't you? You've met the entitled kid who thinks they're superior to everybody else, and you've relished in, not, in pointing out how they're not, Right? But if you teach value, you teach that you're valuable, but at the same time I teach that other people are valuable, then I've got somebody that's got some balance and is not living in shame, and it's, it's a much better way to go. Ephesians 4.29 says, 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. For building up. 
You're always speaking to your children, to your spouse, to other people to build them up. Because it's kind of cool. If you build up all the people around you, you ever heard that that phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats? As you praise others and lift up the value of the other people around you, it lifts you up too with it. You can't help but feel good about yourself as you're praising others. Why? Because this wonderful person is a friend of mine. I must be pretty cool. This wonderful child is my child. I must not be bad. This wonderful spouse, that's my spouse. They married me. I must be okay. And as you praise others, you lift yourself. As you demean others, you push yourself down. And you can't help but going down the garbage disposal with them, and you end up with what? With shame. Okay? So, we want to face our flaws. We want to look them square in the eye, acknowledge them, decide whether or not it's a sin or, or a, a failure, decide whether or not we're promoting shame or just producing godly guilt that leads to repentance. The next thing we want to do, he says, listen, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. And that means we have to sharpen our focus. Sharpen your focus. And the real question is, what is your family's focus? What is your focus? And you, can be a, 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 you don't have to have kids for this. What is your family's focus? What are you finding the most important? What are you building toward? Uh, the Bible tells a story, uh, Jesus tells a story about somebody who built a house on sand versus a house on rocks. And how much better it is to have an actual foundation instead of building on top of sand. You know what I'm saying? And I see a lot of families, a lot of couples building their relationship on sand, on stuff that's not going to last. I mean, I'll be honest, and I get into this all the time, and I semi-apologize for it. I see so many families building their lives on sand and stuff that just doesn't matter. Stuff that, you're you're trying to build a 25-year-old, not a 15-year-old. Okay? Let me give you an example that you'll hate me for. I think athletics is cool. I played sports when I was a kid. I'm physically active now. I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's a limited thing. I think a lot of people are saying this is the most important thing in the world by their actions when it's just something the kid's going to do till they're 20 or 18 or 16. If they make it to 22 with it, great. I see families pouring all their money and all their time into helping their kid be mediocre at soccer or softball or gymnastics or cheerleading or whatever else it is. And what they've been telling their kid for the kid's entire life that they can remember is the most important thing in the world is soccer or sports or whatever game it is. And they pour all their time into that and they're shocked when their kid rejects God when they get to be 20. You've been rejecting God in front of them for the whole time. You've been telling them the whole time that it's a whole lot more important to make the traveling team than it is to be part of God's community. You don't think they'll pick up on that message? You don't think they'll figure that out? This is a, this is a deep, dark secret. But nobody knows this. If your kid makes the traveling team, you're allowed to say no without going to hell. You really are. I, I, I tell, I, this is one of my favorite stories to help you understand this. I was um, a, 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 fresh, a freshman or sophomore at WV, West Virginia University, and we always got there really early to get great seats for the basketball games. And so we would be there, and sometimes they decide they had a whole bunch of early 20s, 18, late, late teen, early 20s, primarily males in a room. You probably should entertain them so they don't get in too much trouble. And so they bring in little things by entertaining. By, by little things, I mean one time they brought in the gymnastics academy from Fairmont, West Virginia. Yeah. They put out mats and a bunch of, I don't know, 6 to 12-year-old girls went out and tumbled. And jumped. And tumbled. And jumped. And we did homework. And then, one of the girls came out, and she tumbled, and she jumped, and we 
put down our homework and went, what in the world is going on here? Well, her dad was the coach of the gymnastics team in Fairmont. Her sister, older sister, was actually on the gymnastics team at West Virginia University, and she was named Mary Lou Retton. And it was pretty obvious that if every other kid in that gymnastics club were to spend the rest of their young adult young life working on gymnastics, they would never get within sight of where Mary Lou Retton was the day she stepped on the mat. And honestly, most kids who are being plunged into 24-7 of some activity are only going to be the one who got to be on the mat with Mary Lou Retton. If your kid is Mary Lou Retton, you know it. No, you, you don't have to ask the coach. You think they'll be any good? Yeah. We had, a, I'm from a little tiny town in West Virginia, Clay, West Virginia, in Clay County, and it's as big as it sounds. And I remember when I was in elementary school, there was a guy from our community who'd actually played in the major leagues for like an hour and a half. I'm, I'm, I mean, he was, he was a hard-throwing pitcher, but he blew out his knee during an off-season and never pitched. He played like one cup of coffee in September. And they were having a men's baseball game. And everybody's out there playing, and this guy steps out to pitch one inning. The catcher like, I'm out. <laughs> this guy just barely, ma- just barely made the majors, and this is years later, and he still was like amazingly better than anybody else on the field. You know what I'm saying? Am I making a point here? Don't spend your child's childhood telling them that something that's not going to be important when they're 25 is the most important thing in the world. Teach them what really matters. Train them to be 25. Let them be a kid and train them to be 25. Does that make sense? Did I annoy you enough? Okay? If your kid's Shaquille O'Neal, you know it when he's 12. <laughs> anyway, that would let, by the way, that kind, that kind of leads to the last one. Because it says in verse 7 of the Deuteronomy passage, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Now, a lot of times we look at that and say, okay, talk about the stuff a lot. But there's an underlying thing that you've got to do if you're going to talk about it a lot. Like, what good does it do to tell your kid, you know, when you're driving, always drive conservatively and carefully and never speed. <laughs> never speed. <laughs> never cut people off. <laughs> You know what they're going to pick up on? Says the dad of a 15-year-old. What you do, not what you say. You have to keep it real. You have to make sure that your speech matches your actions. Because if it doesn't, number one, that makes you, what do we call that word? A hypocrite. Now, here's the question. How many of you are hoping that of your children, you can get at least one good hypocrite out of that? At least one of your kids can grow up to be a real strong hypocrite. Is that like anybody's, is that your goal? That's your goal? Do you, do you, do you want to take you know, your spouse and the people around you and see if you can make them better hypocrites? Do any of you actually like to hang around with hypocrites? Do you have any really good friends and go, oh, he's a hypocrite, but I love him because of it. Uh, Psalm 26, 4 says, I do not sit with the deceitful, nor do I associate with hypocrites. And that's just because we don't like them. Well, if you're modeling hypocrisy to your kids, there's a good chance your kids will think that's how they're supposed to be. So what you say and how you live need to match as much as possible. Does that mean I never fail? No, you're you. You're going to fail. Oh, what? Oh. Oh. So when I model it, my job is not to pretend that I'm perfect, but let them know what it means to be human and how I handle things as a human. Kim and I were, were driving. The, we only had two girls at the time. They were sitting in the back seat. And Kim and I don't fight a lot because she's really hard to fight with. She kind of just defers and knows how to, you know, to short circuit my anger so that we can get past it and just have a discussion that we want. So we're in the car one day and we're actually having an argument, a little bit of a fight. I have no idea what it was about. And the two girls in the back seat, and suddenly at least one of them, both of them started crying. 
And we're like, what, what's wrong? And one of them said, are you guys getting a divorce? I'm like, no, we're having one argument. We're, that's not close. And we explained it, we're not. But I, re- I kind of realized, you know, your kids, they sort of need to see you fight. They need to see that you have differences and you resolve them like grown-ups, at least some of the time. They don't always resolve them like grown-ups, but at least once in a while in front of the kids resolve an argument like a grown-up. Because they need to see what's real. They need to see what life really is. They need to understand that they're not going to find the perfect person and ride off into the sunset to be happily ever after. Happily ever after is only in Disney movies, folks. Okay? It's arguing ever after. That's what it really is. Okay? It's working it out ever after. It's learning to not annoy each other any more than necessary ever after. That's what it is, okay? That's the real world. That's real, okay? And you're also, in the way that you interact with each other, to show that you're real, it's also how you react when you do something wrong with your kids. Because there's actually three ways, two or three ways that you can deal with when you, do, when you screw up, when you fail, when you, not just fail, when you sin, when you do something that's wrong. And one way, which is insanely not helpful, is to go into denial. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't lie. I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I didn't, no, no, you, you, you misunderstood. You, you, you're taking that out of context. I didn't do anything wrong. And your kid's going, hmm, mommy's a hypocrite. That must be a good thing. I should be one of those too. Okay? You can do that. It doesn't work. Kids see through you. They know you better than you know you. They're with you all the time. Okay? A second thing you can do, which I think is even more damaging, is instead of taking God's path where when you sin, you ask for forgiveness, you repent of it, and then you move into a, 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 a forgiven state and you get past it, you can take your failings and bottle them into shame. Anybody want to say ouch to that one? See, God gives us the path out. The path out is through repentance. If we don't take the path out, we end up with shame because there's no other way to cleanse it. And you, you, your kids can watch you do that. Your kids can watch you take a failing, a, a sin that you've committed, and bottle it up and make it shame in your life. And that's not helpful for them either. Or, of course, you can do the right thing. The ghosts just leave? or You can do the right thing, which is to confess your sin, acknowledge God's forgiveness, and accept it and move on. Now, some of you, when I get to this point, some of you believe God lies. Some of you believe God's a liar. Going, oh, not me! Yeah, you. Because God says... That when we confess our sins and repent of our sins, he forgives us. And some of you don't believe that he forgives you. So when you do something wrong and you ask for forgiveness, you don't believe that he gives it, so you end up in shame. The reality is he says he forgives you. When God speaks, it's truth. So he forgives you. Does that make sense? So you've got to model it. You've got to live it in front of your kids. When your kids screw up, what do you do? When they commit a sin... To work toward the, the godly, godly bad feelings that lead to repentance. Let's help them develop guilt in a positive way so they can ask for forgiveness and move on from it. So otherwise, you end up with kids full of shame. Anybody? Or I guess I could put it this way. When I talk about shame, some of you, it's too real. It's too accurate. You know exactly what I'm talking about because you live in shame. And the two things I would say are, number one, do you really want to pass that to your kids? And number two, do you really want to keep carrying that yourself? I hope the answer to both of those is no. Now, let me provide a piece of the puzzle that I really haven't talked about, but I've implied the whole way through. See, there is one key thing. And if it's not there in the middle of what we've been teaching and talking about the whole time, basically none of this works. If you don't have this key central piece, all the rest I've talked about is just mumbo jumbo. Because the only way any of this works is if at the center of it, you've got Jesus Christ. 
All this is just talk. If at the center of it, there's not Jesus Christ literally coming as the Son of God to earth, literally living a life without sin, literally dying and taking our sins on him when he dies, and literally rising from the dead so we can have new life. If I don't have that in the middle, nothing I've talked about makes any sense. None of it works. Does that make sense? And if in your personal life, in your own personal private life, if you don't have Jesus Christ in the middle of this, forgiving your sins, if you don't have that reality that you've accepted what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, if you personally don't have that in the center, none of what I talked about will work. Because the only avenue out you have is shame. Because there's no other path. When there is sin, when there are things in your life that you know are wrong, you can't just make it go away. Have you tried that one recently? Just wish it out of existence? No, it stays here, it festers, it becomes shame. That's the only out without Jesus. But with Jesus, as we confess our sins, he's able to forgive us our sins. And if you would like to have Jesus, if you'd like to have that relationship with him, if you've been here more than one week, you know how this works. If you're ready for a relationship with Christ, all you got to do is grab one of these blue bags. We've got some here and here and some back on those bookshelves. And if you grab a blue bag, what happens? Somebody who's been trained will come up to you and say, hey, can I unpack that with you? If you give them permission, they'll take about seven minutes. They'll walk you through the contents of the bag, and they'll show you how to have a relationship with Christ. And now you're in a position where you can have the forgiveness and you can escape the shame. Now, if you already have a relationship with Christ, one of the best things you can do for your family, one of the best things you can do for your kids and everybody else around you is to proclaim the fact that you're a follower. And we do that through baptism. Baptism is simply being immersed in water. We do it every first Wednesday. It's acknowledging that Jesus Christ died and was raised for you, so you're following him in baptism. If you'd like to do that, just let us know. We do that, like I said, the first Wednesday of every month. We'd love to have you included because you can make a powerful impact on your kid's life that way. It may be that something I talked about, you want to pray about it. You, don't know, you just want to talk to God. I'm going to cross over there. That's what that's for. It's a place for you to go pray. If you'd like to do that during this next song, feel free. That's what it's for. If you want to get somebody to pray with you, you've got a couple people over there who'd love to pray with you. You can just grab one of them if you want, and they'll, they'll pray with you. You may want to take communion. We've got a communion station back there and one over here. And those are there so that you can sort of reaffirm to yourself the reality of what Christ did for you, the fact that Jesus is in the center of this whole thing. And that he did die for you and he did rise from the dead. As you take the bread that represents his body and you take the, the wine that represents his blood, that you remind yourself of what he did. All of us have guilt because we're not living into the standard we set for ourselves and because we're not living into the standard that God sets for us. And we have a choice how we live. We have a choice how we teach our kids. We can fall into the worldly grief that produces death, the shame that drags us down, or we can live into the forgiveness that gives us life. I would challenge you for yourself for your children, for your family, for your spouse. Don't live into the grief, the shame that drags you down. But instead, walk into the forgiveness that God offers that brings life. Would you stand with us?